Welcome everyone. Welcome to tonight's webinar. We're so happy that you all are joining us. While people are piling into the webinar, if you would go ahead and find the chat button, it should be in your controls um, at the webinar. And if you'd like to just introduce yourselves, let us know where you're joining from, what your school is, what language your program teaches, so that we'll be able to kind of connect and see who is here. Um, you all will get a copy of the chat at the end of the webinar. So if there's anyone who shares anything, don't worry, you'll be able to go back and get that. If it's a colleague or someone from another school, you'll get a copy of the chat in the end. So go ahead, um, add your information in the chat and we'll get started in just a moment. Let's make sure I can see everyone who is here. Okay, let me see, let me make sure and make sure that the chat is enabled for everyone. For some reason in the last webinar, it wasn't, and I don't know why. So I will check on that just to see, because I don't see anyone in the chat yet. So I'll check it in. It says just uh, Mamta wrote that the chat is disabled. Yes, I'm not sure why it is doing that. Let me see. It should not be doing that. Um, I'll check on that and make sure that it's available. I think this happened This happened a few webinars ago because they made some changes in one of the Zoom updates and it's not automatically open anymore. So I will fix that and then you guys can add your information. Let's go ahead and get started and then... Um, while um, our presenters start presenting, I'll make sure that you have information. So when you see me typing in there, you'll know, okay? All right, so um, tonight's webinar that you have signed up for <laughs> is Creating Successful Pathways to Proficiency Through Assessment in Community-Based Heritage Language Schools. So making sure you're in the right place. Um, we're so excited tonight to be joined with the coalition of community-based language schools and to have some expert panelists here to share with us tonight. We're gonna to get to hear from Linda Egnatz, who is our executive director at the Global Seal. We're gonna hear from Masako Douglas. Um, unfortunately tonight, Angela Hasheva is not gonna be able to join us, but we will have some information that we'll share about her program, Eva Prionas, and then Joy Payton, fortunately, she's here. She's going to share some information about the coalition with you in just a minute. And my name is Dawn Samples, and I'm the Director for Professional Learning at Avon Assessment. So some of the things we're going to address tonight, we're going to talk about the pathways to proficiency and accreditation. We're going to talk about the kinds of tests that you might take and what they measure, who should test, why should they test, and best practices. And what are the benefits? What can, can learners gain by this? Um, so Linda's really going to be able to hopefully explain a lot of things for you. And um, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions as well as soon as I get the chat working. Okay, friends, let's go ahead and move forward. Um, you will be getting this information in the chat as soon as I get it working, um, so that if you want to follow us on social media or learn more or reach out to us later, you'll have all of this at your fingertips. Um, for those of you who have not yet had the opportunity and the joy of hearing Linda present about the Global Seal, Linda is joining us from um, Scotland tonight, this morning, tomorrow morning. It's very early for her, late for her, middle of the night for her right now. Um, and then our other panelists and guests are Ava Prionas and Masako Douglas, and then, as I said, Joy, Peyton, and myself. So Joy, I am going to, um, I'm going to turn it over to you, and I will let you take over from this point and tell us a little bit more about the community-based heritage language schools. Yes, thank you so much, Dawn, and what a privilege it is to be able to do this webinar with Avant with Linda and the Global Seal, the State Seals, and with Ava and Masako, this is this is just fabulous. And we're so happy that you all are here. I'm gonna, going to be brief. Um, the Coalition of Community-Based Heritage Language Schools was formed um, 
about 12 years ago to bring these schools together. Community-based heritage language schools often work in isolation. We very much want to and are bringing the schools together to collaborate, to learn from each other. The coalition board consists of people from Portuguese, Chinese, Czech, Slovak, Japanese, and German schools who are founders and directors of community-based schools. And so they are very strong in terms of um, making sure that these schools are successful. We also work with language representatives and that could be the next slide. And Ava is one of them um, representing Greek. We decided, uh, Dawn, yeah we decided that um, there's no way that our little team could connect with schools. So you can see there the, uh, the languages that are represented by the language representatives. Just take a look at that. And if you see a language that we do not, we are not representing all of the languages taught in the US. So if you see a language that's missing, please, I, at my, the la my last slide is going to have my email. Please write to me and say, hey, this language is missing and I'd love to work with you because we would love to work with you also. And you can read about the language representatives at that, um, at that uh, link. Oh, and the chat is now open. So please introduce yourselves, let us know who you are, where you are and what language you work with. Um, okay, so the next slide is um, we, one of the things that we work with um, the language representatives to do is to document heritage language schools. Um, there are hundreds of thousands of schools teaching hundreds of languages across the, the United States, and we want to document all of them. We can look at the next slide. So far, we have documented schools teaching 38 languages, and you can see there next to the language listed how many programs we've documented. So some people have worked very hard to document their programs, and we're getting to the point where all of the programs teaching some of these languages are documented. Um, if you don't see your language there, then please uh, work with people to doc, oh, right, next slide, thank you for that, to document um, your, the schools teaching, teaching languages that you know about, because we want to document all of them across the entire United States. And in the next slide, you can see the map of where the schools are. Um, so we're working on the map. Whenever we, we update, we, we, have more, we have more schools um, that we put on the map and we're continually updating. Okay, next, next slide. Um, right, so here there's a survey on our website and I'll show you our website in a second. It says community, it says uh, schools, survey of schools and all you do is click on there and fill out the information about your school. We report on it at our conference and in other ways and it's very interesting to see what the characteristics of these schools are. Or you can just contact Tommy Liu and there's his um, email. So yes, there's our webpage. Um, to, you can learn about the language representatives there, Heritage Language Schools, you can complete the survey. Um, about us, you can sign up to receive our newsletter. Click on About Us, go down to Newsletter, and then you'll be always on top of everything we're doing. And there are a whole lot of language representatives I see in this meeting and a lot of people on our newsletter. So thank you all for joining. It's exciting to see um, your names and what languages you're working with. Okay, the next page, um, Masako is here and she's going to talk about um, a, an exciting opportunity to, to share. Masako? Just in time, Masako. Hi. Hi, Hi, Joy. Sorry to be late. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, introducing that the online forum which uh, the coalition established. And there are many uh, topics in this forum. And one of them is uh, related to today's topic, uh, that the proficiency recognizing the student bilingual and bilateral skills. And then this forum, everybody is welcome and just, you know, post, post the question or just the, please provide the information if you know. So this is a kind of space which uh, we can just, you know, exchange this idea. And how to get there, it's free. 
everybody can just join just by you know setting account for free. So go to the homepage of coalition and then there is a resource button on the top menu and then click on that. And then when you go down and there you will see the web forum. Okay, and then you will see the list of the folders. Okay, and then be careful. This is not the real link. It's an image. And then when you go down a little bit and then you see this blue writing, click here to access the web forum. And when you click on it, you can go to the real uh, online forum. And then you just type in all the information. And then one of them is, as I said, silo biliteracy and the global silo biliteracy. So please, uh, spread this information to your friends or the schools, and then just read all the posting and then join that interaction. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Masako is there to facilitate the discussions. Uh, yes. And also when you can in about us over on the left hand side, you can see the conference webpage and we have just held our 2022 conference. We have posted all kinds of resources from that conference videos so go take a look at that um, there is a lot on there and then um, the next slide in 2023 our conference will be october 13th and 14th so we decided to do it the second weekend in october and it's going to again to be an exciting conference and what's really fabulous is when people invite their language groups to do the conference together. Let's do this together and then we can share. And I think that might be my last slide. And if you want, if you have any questions, if you want to become a language representative, document your schools, just contact me there, joy at patents.us. And thank you very much. And I'll turn it over to Linda. Thank you, Joy. And I, I just want to reiterate, um, Joy's encouragement to really become a part of, of the coalition. Uh, one of the other hats that I wear is as the president elect for the Joint National Councils on Languages. And we, you know, we work with language policy and legislation issues. And, you know, we want to represent the voice of the really the hundreds and thousands of students that are learning languages in community-based programs. But we need to know that you're there because we need to be able to count you and to show the impact um, that potential legislation could have that would benefit your program. And so while legislators like to hear the nice stories, they need to see the numbers to make real policy decisions. So, you know, please um, join, um, let your voice be heard. And, and then as a coalition, you have a voice and a seat at the table. So I just want to really reiterate Joy's um, uh, plea and call um, to really get the word out. If, you, if you're already a member, then, you know, find another school that can join because that's really how, how we represent you well um, at the national level. So with that, um, I'd like to just sort of introduce myself and, and um, welcome you all. So um, as Dawn mentioned, I'm the executive director for the Global Seal. I'm um, here in Scotland, where I've just attended the Bilingualism Matters conference and participated in that event, and doing, you know, working with the same kinds of programs and, and a part of the effort and the work of Bilingualism Matters as an organization here um, based at the University of Edinburgh is, again, is counting, it's doing the research, it's providing evidence and documentation of the impact of the work that you do. And uh, the Global Seal is truly global. We're um, here issuing certificates. And so it's really, truly um, exciting to be a part of that project. And I just can't wait to share a little more with you. So our goal, and um, I'm not sure if I have that, I do have control of the slides, um, is to really just talk to you about the seals of biliteracy. And I use that in the plural because there are 49 states with some kind of a program, although they don't all call it a seal as well as the Global Seal of Biliteracy. And each and every one of them, you know, we're documenting in multiple ways that they excite language learners. And we're looking here at sort of the high school lesson because that's um, the point of impact for the state seals of biliteracy. 
Um, as we go through, you'll find that um, the global seal could also apply to some of your younger, not yet high school senior um, language learners. And so that's also an exciting opportunity to create a real pathway um, that could include not just the state seal of biliteracy, um, but also, oops, somehow I got muted there, um, a global seal of biliteracy. And it seems like I've lost control here again. I don't know why of the mouse. Do you know? Let's see. It says I'm, oh, there we go. It's just delayed. It must be that big, big wide ocean between us. So anyway, <laughs> um, and so what we see is that students are excited about getting recognition. So if you have an opportunity to award a state seal, and we'll talk about that um, in the webinar, I really encourage you to do that. And I, I do that because it is the first time that state governments say that being bilingual is important. And if they're going to recognize it, we want to take advantage of that opportunity. It may not be available to all of you. We're going to talk about some strategies to maybe make that a, a more of a possibility and a likelihood. But you can all qualify for a global seal of biliteracy. And, and again, if you can do both, even, even better for your language learners. And so we want to think about the seal of biliteracy. Oftentimes we look at this as a, a celebration, and it is an, an event where we're going to just sort of applaud our students and recognize them. We're going to give them a certificate. And then what happens next? And that's the part that is most important to me, is what happens next. Students want to know, well, why am I learning this language? What am I going to do with it? And it's nice to get an award and it's nice to get a trophy or recognition, but it somehow feels like it's the end of the race and it's done and it's over. And what am I going to do with that certificate? You know, uh, my mom will put it in a, a folder and give it to me later when I leave home. We want the students to leverage their bilingualism. We want them to continue growing their language skills and we want them to use them. And so, yes, it is going to celebrate their skills and their accomplishments, but we want to put on the framework of what else can it do for our language learners? And with the Global Seal, we're working with lots of different language learners. We're looking, we're working with students in the middle school and the high school, but also at the university and adults. And we're doing that all over the world because if it's if we want language and bilingualism and multilingualism to be recognized, we have to do it in a formal way. And when employers begin to ask, well, do you have a seal of biliteracy? We'll know that we've won because that's when it becomes real to students that somebody else wants to know if I'm bilingual. And so I think that's um, one of the really important pieces um, that we wanna think about here. And so these are just some of the student benefits um, that we're gonna talk about, because, but the most important one and one that's been really an impact um, on heritage language programs is this quote that we received in one of the student surveys in the focus groups about the seals of iLiteracy. And that is the student said, it gives you a motive to finish. Before I was like, why am I in this class? They're ready to get out of the class as opposed to not only continuing the class, but actually working hard to, to win and acquire the seal of biliteracy. So these are just um, some of the pieces that you'll see students talk about as why they want um, a seal of biliteracy. Um, most importantly, um, they look at it as an opportunity to highlight their language skills and distinguish themselves in applications, whether that's an application for a, um, a scholarship, for college um, admission, for a job placement, um, whether it's looking at college credit. One of the exciting things right now 
um, with the Global Seal of Bioliteracy is work working with a number of universities. The most recent one is the University of Texas at Arlington, and they're providing 14 hours of college credit for our students in any language that come with a Global Seal of Bioliteracy. And so we think about that in terms of the dollars, uh, money saved for parents, but also just the value of recognition of those language skills. And so students make the connection and realize the value. And so if we look at the state seals of biliteracy, that first opportunity for your language learners, there are 49 states that have some kind of a program. Um, not all of the states will call it a seal of biliteracy. They're quite different. And so um, you'll be getting all of these resources after the webinar, but this is a link on the globalseal.com website that will take you to an interactive map where you can find out more about your particular state. And so when we look at each state, um, these are just some of their, their insignias or their, their logos for their seals. And you'll notice that each one's different. Um, in fact, we see that they're not all called a seal. Some are called an endorsement um, or a certificate. So I'm in Illinois. Um, ours is an Illinois State Seal of Biliteracy. But on the far right, Indiana, theirs is the Certificate of Multilingual Proficiency. And so sometimes it, a parent might even be frustrated because they're looking for a seal of biliteracy for their state, but they can't find one because technically that's not what their state calls it. And so the resource on the Global Seal will help you figure out what is your state um, and what does it offer. And so um, typically in the state level, it's going to be offered just to those high school seniors. Some states do not include private school programs or schools that aren't public schools, or they include public schools, but maybe your, um, you know, your, the students that are in your program attend a public school that doesn't opt in to do the program because it is optional. It's not anything mandated or required by the state. And so that, you know, that becomes potentially another challenge. Um, the state seals may require in some states that the district apply, that the district has an administrator that supervises and does reporting for the program. But there are some states where the student applies directly to the state. So that's a different kind of situation. And again, each state has its own rules about what tests are accepted or not, as well as what is the level of proficiency? In other words, how much language do the students have to demonstrate um, to be able to uh, receive their certificate? And so to learn about your state's program, this is again that website. This is what that interactive map looks like. I've clicked on the state of Illinois where I live, and it gives you a synopsis of the state program. What are the requirements for it on the English side? What are the requirements on the other language side? Whether that language is a first or a second language doesn't matter. Um, the student needs to qualify um, in two languages for the, that's the, the by part of, the, the, of the, the name of the program, the biliteracy. And there's also a, a button that will give you, it, that'll say website, and it will take you to that particular state's information. So you can find out more about, um, you know, what their program is and what tests they offer or accept and so on. And so when you, if you've discovered that your, your program students can participate in some way at, with a state seal of biliteracy program, I, I wanna encourage you to do it. So that next step then becomes articulation and communication. So you wanna to talk to the parents and inform them. You want to begin to have conversations with the school counselors because oftentimes students in your programs are not an English language learner. They've learned their own, um, maybe a home language um, alongside of English and they've never been identified as having another language. Uh, the language you teach isn't, isn't offered in their school. And so there's no way for the school to document that they're bilingual or that they have these skills. Um, they would, and, and you know, they could benefit from having that documented. They, they could potentially get world language transcript credit on their high school diploma 
as a competency-based credit. They could get a seal of iLiteracy, but it starts with conversations between your school program and the local schools where your students attend. And so make friends with the administrators and begin to have a conversation about what your program is doing and its results. So from there, we'll kind of shift to the global seal of biliteracy, which is available to each and every one of your programs. We offer three different levels of certification um, and they're available as soon as the student can qualify with one of our qualifying tests. In other words, there's not an age or a grade requirement. So we have seen a number of students in middle schools qualify, especially from our heritage programs. But we have three levels. We um, are up to 134 different languages. And we do have tests on both the ACTFL and CEFR or the Common European Framework of Reference um, scales that are available. Um, and we want students to earn more than one. And this is part of that retention um, sort of carrot program <laughs> to be able to get students in middle school potentially to earn their first global seal. Then maybe they'll level up. Maybe they'll also qualify for a state seal. And then they're continuing in your program and, and uh, into the university level and can earn yet higher levels of the global seal by literacy. So this is, um, we talked about the 49 states for the state seal. The global seal has been awarded in 50 states, the District of Columbia. The black countries are countries where the global seal has been issued. And we have either testing or applications in going on or applications in process in all of those countries in green. So the global seal is continuing to grow and um, just get more and more exciting. And so your students will be earning a credential that's being earned potentially by their counterparts in the home country, maybe in English, as opposed to the language um, that they're um, being tested in. And so one of the things that I mentioned earlier was really important is helping students know what to do next. So the Global Seal of Biliteracy certificates are serial numbered. And that means that a student can add, share them digitally, they can add them to an application, they can add them to a CV, they can um, share them with a potential employer or university. They can also create, if there are a lot of students now for high school as they're preparing for college, create LinkedIn profiles. Um, the Global Seal of Biliteracy is, has that serial number, so it actually populates under licenses and certifications on a LinkedIn profile. Um, the young lady here on the, the left, Annabella, um, learned um, Spanish in school, um, but she also took Chinese in a heritage language program. She was Chinese on her father's side, and she qualified for two global seals and used those as a way to uh, get um, entrance into Cornell University where she's studying medicine. Another tool that the Global Seal has to make it easy for your students to share their language stories and maybe the, about their, their culture and their identity is our language profile. So when a student enters in their serial number on the language profile, it will populate with a picture of their actual certificate, as well as a description of what that means that the student can do at that level. Remember, there were three different levels of credentialing. And additionally, there is this little language pro, uh, sort of journey um, text box where they can talk about the school, your, your program, um, their, maybe their visits to uh, their grandmother and the home country, um, uh, cultural part activities within the community in which they've participated and so on. So it gives them a way to describe more about what, how language is important to them and what they've been able to do with their language. So if we kind of shift a little bit then to the, that how do we implement? What does that look like? Well, it starts with focusing on language proficiency. So sometimes as teachers, we get caught up um, in, you know, making sure all of the, you know, the, the words are, the vocabulary is spelled correctly and the grammar is in the right order. But if we take a step back and take a big picture view of what proficiency looks like and what the pathways toward that, we want to be sort of begin with the end in mind 
and think about proficiency in a more macro way. Um, and the first level of, you know, is can they be understood? Do they, you know, can they get some things done even at a very basic level? And then how much a language do they use when they describe themselves or tell a story? And how organized is the language that they're using, what kind of vocabulary. And then maybe we start to talk about at higher levels, you know, the more specifics of accuracy and pronunciation. And so we want to think about language proficiency in terms of how students are going to be tested for the seal of biliteracy, because it's not a test of grammar and it's not a spelling vocabulary quiz. What it is, is a test of what they're able to do with the language that they own themselves, that they can, they, they've acquired. And so we begin to look at this actful cone and we focus on sort of these three areas for most um, students from um, kindergarten through 12th grade. And that would be the novice, the intermediate, and the advanced range. And what we see with heritage language learners is they're often in the advanced range in their listening skills. But those other skills need to begin to develop and catch up, the literacy, the reading, and the writing, um, but also um, you know, the speaking, because you know, maybe they're listening all of the time, but they're not actually using the language in return. And so one of uh, the important things that you can do as a language program is provide your educators, your teachers, um, with tools to learn about what does the proficiency look like at these different levels. And I put in the word, the phrase intermediate mid, which is that most popular level for most state seals, as well as the first level of certification for the global seal. And so here are some uh, resources there um, on the actful.org. We're talking about the actful scale. Um, they provide some descriptions um, that you can actually watch and listen and read of what those samples look like. Um, Avant, the company that is just graciously providing this web platform for you, has another tool called Avant Advance that will actually help you um, work through learning about what proficiency looks like at each level, and then you get to practice and apply it and see if, in fact, you, you'll agree with the rater to see what kind of rating they got, and you'll find out why you did well or, or what more you need to learn about that proficiency level um, to be able to help you understand where your students are and how they're doing. It's also really important to let students know that they're on the pathway, that it's not a wait till the end and find out if we pass or fail. We want students to know all along the way how they're doing. And so there are a lot of different tools for that. And one of the things that we've created at the Global Seal is this free language passport. It's a downloadable PDF um, you can do it in color or black and white, and students can take an assessment test of their skills and then kind of chart their progress. And you'll notice that at the levels of certification, uh, there's actually the little marker that's, you know, that says you're at a global seal level. And the reason why we do this is because students are not, it's unusual for them to be at the same level of proficiency in all four skills, speaking, listening, reading, and writing. There's, they have their strengths. Some are more shy about speaking. Some like to read, some hate to write. So you, you know, you're gonna find that students will, will benefit from knowing where to focus um, because you don't want them to qualify in three out of the four areas and miss the, the big award at the end. And to celebrate those small incremental steps, we've created pathway award ribbons. And these are available on both the actual scale as well as the CEFR or Common European Framework of Reference Scale that's used more often in Europe and other um, international places. And it allows you to recognize the students. And this is a way to get your parents excited and involved that your students are making progress and keep them um, you know, in terms of the retention in your program. I wanted to point out this chart from our last year's um, statistics. You'll notice that um, these are by the level, the light green being functional fluency, our first level of credential, 
then the middle green being our advanced low level on the actual scale. That's our working fluency credential level. And, you know, that's really what you need in the job space that, so, you know, someone who can really use the language in lots of different ways. And then we also have a higher professional level of fluency. But you'll notice that we gave an awarded an awful lot of middle school students last year with a global seal of biliteracy and actually 6% of them qualified at that working level of fluency. And that's because you're doing a great job in your programs. So now it's just time to, to test students and start recognizing and celebrating those successes that you as a school share with your students and those parents. And so let's, if we begin to talk then more specifically about testing, there's sort of a before, a during, and after. And keeping in mind that it's not a pass or fail, this language learning is a continuum. And all you're going to try to find out is where are your students on the pathway? And wherever they are on the pathway, they can improve um, in some area or in all four areas and move up through those certification levels. And so when we think about testing, it's not a, a did you pass or did you fail? It's where are you and what can we, you know, how do we get to the next step? So one of the important things, especially if you're working with um, trying to uh, have your students get a state seal of biliteracy is I think there's a, a huge benefit if you as a language program will test your own students. And that's because there's some benefits to that. First of all, it adds relevancy to your program if you become the gateway to the seal of biliteracy, whether it's a state seal, a global seal, or both. And when you get those test scores, you're going to get information back about how your program is doing. And that's not information you would receive if, if the school, the public school tested your students instead of you. So I think that's a huge value to be able to do that. You can have your own celebration. You can invite the media. You can draw lots of attention. Um, parents will know your school's doing a great job at, you, and that there's some efficacy to your program and students are excited and the, the kindergartners will be excited because then they're gonna get to get one when they're in eighth grade or 12th grade and, and get excited about it. And it begins to build that retention in your program. But to have your test accepted by the public school, you want to go back again to those counselors and administrators and help them understand that you're giving a valid test. Um, public schools sometimes don't want to include the, uh, the other languages because they don't know how to find the test. They, you know, they'd have to find 20 different tests or whatever. And, and so they just don't even try. And so you can be a solution for them because you only have to find the test for your language. You only need to find one test. And so one of the things that we'll look at on the Global Seal Biliteracy's website is we have this test finder. So all you have to do is find your language and it will show all of the tests for that particular language. And then you can click on and learn more about that particular test. So that's one of the things um, that I think is really, truly important um, that, you know, so now you've got your test, you've learned about it and be informed if you are also working to get recognized with a state seal of biliteracy. And some states do an incredible job, including um, less common languages that are being taught in our Saturday and Sunday and weekend programs. Um, but on your state, on the state seal site, hopefully they will include a list of assessments. If your language is there, terrific. Now you know what test would be accepted. And if you pick a test that's accepted by both the global seal and your state seal, then your students can get both. If your language is not there, you can begin to advocate with your state that for equity, equ excuse me, equity and access, that your language be included. And please feel free to reach out to me um, or to, to Joy about helping you do that um, so that your students can be recognized with both programs. The next thing, now you have, let's say you've chosen your test for your students. You want to learn about the test beforehand. You want your teachers to know what's going to be expected of the students, but you want your students and parents to know as well. 
Um, most test companies will have some guidelines, some test preparation tools. Um, you'll notice that um, there is a test taker guide um, that's provided on this, um, the Avant website for the stamp test, and there's a video. Um, you'll see on the Alta side, another, a lot of our smaller languages are using that test from uh, that comes from the state of Georgia. Um, they have some preparation, but make sure that you do that. Familiarize your students with a sample test if one is available because they want to know what the platform looks like. What is, you know, what, how do I use a keyboard for the foreign language potentially? So these are all important things that you can do for your teachers, your parents, as well as for your students. And then prepare the students themselves um, for the testing experience. One thing that we do offer um, on the Global Seal is this free self-assessment. Um, and it's just a quick little tool to help them um, assess if they're in the range for the seal of biliteracy with, um, at one of those levels. Uh, they're little five minute mini tests based on can do statements in English. And um, they'll get a little score at the end. If they've answered honestly, it's a pretty accurate one. Um, and then during the testing, if you want your test to be accepted by the Global Seal, if you want it to be a test accepted by your state seal in your public school, you want to test under rigorous testing conditions, just as if the school were doing it for them. Think about this as sort of a high stakes test. Um, you wanna make sure you have um, all of the equipment that it's, you know, they have the headsets that they can use for the recording. Um, that you have, a lot of times the schools assume that it's, you know, the mom and dad that are, you know, watching the students take the test and that's not acceptable. Um, it needs to be a neutral person, um, someone that the school, we don't want to give them a, a reason not to take your test scores from your students. So, um, you want to make sure that you follow the same guidelines that the school would follow. Um, and the test company is there for support and they usually give you this information as well. So uh, make sure you read all of that. After the um, students have been have tested, um, make sure that you share, if, if the test company provides you with some score data, this is from the stamp test by Avant Assessment, um, notice that there's group test data here. You'll see as a group, look at the variety in a single classroom of student performance. That's normal. Um, students have their strengths and weaknesses, and just because they progressed into the next year of the program doesn't mean they, they all progressed with the same num uh, you know, amount of language skills. You could, with this particular test, you can see what students wrote, and you can read, um, you know, read what they wrote, and you can listen to what they said in their speech. That's going to give you a coaching tool. You're going to get an idea about what your students do without you <laughs> um, there for support. And, um, and what they're doing on their own. That's that sort of proficiency piece. And there's a score report that also can go to the student themselves. And this is incredibly powerful. Um, I love the, the work by John Hattie on visual learning because it says that this is what makes help students catch on to how they're doing is they can see it visually. And this is like an infographic of my progress. And notice again, this student, like others that we, you know, they're not the same level in each of their skills. But the score report gives them not just the report, not just like here's your, your score, but it tells you what you did to get that score. So students like, oh, I got to keep doing that and what it is you need to do to get to the next level. And that's even more important. So it's those um, metacognitive strategies that students will benefit from. So let's say you've tested, um, hopefully your school um, will, you know, you, you've done it in a way that they will take those scores. The Global Seal has a very simple submission and application. We have a candidate sheet where you put the names of the students as you want them to appear on their certificate. You put in their test scores, and then we do all the processing and we send you beautiful certificates that are personalized uh, with the students' names, their languages, your school's name, and that serial number that they can use to digitally share that. And the Global Seal does that for you for free. Now, we don't cover the cost of testing, but we cover everything else here for you. Now, to give you some support in making that connection with your local public schools, 
we have some resources. So on our globalseal.com website, um, there is a link here, the community-based hyphen heritage language schools. Um, there's a brochure that kind of summarizes what I've shared in this webinar. And there's also a customizable template letter that is you, a letter that you could put on your school's letterhead and share it with your public school along with your students' test scores to say, this is how the test was given. This test is recognized by, and you can name where it's recognized. If it's recognized by your state seal, include that information um, and do, you know, so that they can say, uh, feel comfortable that you've done due diligence in providing a good testing experience with a reliable test um, that they can then add to, because they need the diversity as well. Um, and so the last piece is make sure that you promote your program. Um, how you want to think about how will they learn about your program? Will you add it to your website with the global seal choice um, option? We have a badge with some text all ready to go. You just can cut and paste it right onto your website, but you can do videos. Um, you can create more information with a gallery of all of your student awardees like um, Angela Hashiva's done here on the ABSA website for Bulgarian. Um, you can do flyers. There are a couple here. Um, this one of these is from the Alpharetta Tamil School that's um, using both a state as well as a global seal. So you have great options but you don't, you, you know, you, you want to make sure you promote the program and most importantly, celebrate what you want to duplicate. Make sure you have a big celebration and the students feel incredibly rewarded and parents can have an opportunity to be incredibly proud. And so with that, um, I just, you know, going to pass the kind of close this section. We're going to have, I think, a little couple minutes for some questions. Then we're going to hear about some other programs. So when, you know, whether it's a state seal or a global seal, make sure that you sort of, you know, you then begin to celebrate that, that you get the word out because it's that kind of publicity that's going to build your programs, that's going to build your retention, and most importantly, give your students something um, to celebrate and leverage, um, a way to distinguish themselves for their next steps, whether those are academic or professional. And so with that, I believe I am passing it back to Dawn. There we go, I got it. Took a second, There's a, there is a little bit of a delay between here and there. Um, thank you, Linda. We do have some questions for you. Um, one of our questions, I think you addressed just a little bit just a second ago around promotional materials. Um, but one of the questions in the chat from Mamta Tripathi is, is there a template or sample of a persuasive letter that they could use to approach a school district about letting their students take the proficiency test at school? Um, there isn't, but that is something we can certainly think about adding for you because we're trying, we want to have those tools for you. Um, so on the school side, there is, you know, those considerations, there are schools that are going to be, you know, really excited about doing that once you've made them aware. There's other schools that might be a little intimidated about finding the test for your language. Um, but that's a great idea. And, and thank you for sharing that. And, and we'll look at what we can do on that front. Thank you. Um, we have two questions in the Q&A um, section. Um, both of these are from Russ Shugart. Shugart? I'm not sure. I don't want to butcher your last name. Um, the first question is, are there data points or do we have data points on the seals of biliteracy earners who continued on to employment as interpreters or as translators? So on the state seal side, sadly, there's... Um, not a lot of data. They do publish a report. The 2020 report is the most recent, um, which reflects the 20, actually the 2018-19 school year, where it gives us a total. There were, um, on that, that state seal report, we saw over 100,000 students receiving a seal of biliteracy from the states that were reporting. So that's a huge number of students that can feed into translation pipelines. On the global seal side, we have a little bit more of that available. We have a number of students who, for example, have leveled up. 
Um, we certainly know, obviously, the numbers and the languages of our students um, in terms of, of, I guess you could say, larger groups. But tracking students is something we are right now um, in the process of building some tools for, um, where students would be able then um, to kind of sort of let us know where they're going. Otherwise, for the most part right now, it is anecdotal. But we do have some students have gone into some, use their global seal as an entry into a, uh, like as a pretest, if you will, into a translating program. So, um, so we see a lot of that. But in terms of quantitative data, um, that is certainly not for the state seals. And on the global seal, it's on its way. Awesome, thank you. That's really interesting data to consider. Um, the other question that Russ had is um, regarding my language journey, the National Museum of Language um, virtual would be interested in highlighting and sharing individual stories from seals of biliteracy earners um, or successful programs. Um, how might such an initiative be developed? So what might be his next steps for? Well, Russ, I would to... say, Contact, um, send me an email and we can have a chat. That's easy enough. Um, I'd also just like to say thank you to Michelle Aoki, who is answering questions in the chat for everyone right now. Um, He's there an expert. Some questions. Yay, um, Michelle. <laughs> the local resident expert in there. Um, so there were some questions about the differences between the state seal and the global seal. And I know Michelle answered some of those questions and gave some examples of ways that they explained the differences um, in Washington. I don't know if you have anything else that you want to add to that. Um, and I know that there's also links on the Global Seals website about the state seal as well. Right. We Again, we want to totally support the state seals, but they are individual state recognition programs. Um, the biggest difference is they are only for those schools typically that opt in um, and that those the kinds of schools in some states may be limited. Uh, they are typically recognizing um, high school seniors and sometimes those seniors may be able to qualify prior to their high school year. Sometimes they actually have to qualify during that high school year. So, um, so that's essentially kind of the state program and they all, each state can determine its own tests as well as the threshold or the criteria of, you know, what the level of proficiency needs to be. Um, there are four states um, that have college credit um, that is provided to their state seal recipients. Um, other states have um, uni some universities or colleges that will offer something, but it's not necessarily a statewide program. Um, Global Seal is international and does not have those same sort of um, age or grade restrictions. Um, so we test, um, we've tested against some, we've had the youngest students be fifth graders and our, our oldest was 79. So um, we, we, we're excited. We work with companies that are testing um, their employees um, as well as with schools and certainly university students that can very much benefit from having um, a language um, way to document their language um, in their resumes and so on. So the I think the global space of the geographic is the big difference. And the second big difference is, is who qualifies or who can participate. Great, thank you, Linda. Um, if I just wanted to make a note that if you have any questions that come up, even as we move on, we have, we're gonna go ahead and move on to our next presenter now. But if you have other questions for Linda, please don't hesitate to put those in the chat or to put them in the Q&A um, and we can get back to you on that. And you're also gonna have an opportunity to do a survey at the end with any other questions or connections or ideas that you have. Um, the survey will pop up for you at the end of the webinar. But it'll also come to you in an email tomorrow. If you can't think of anything tonight, don't worry about it. You can fill the survey out later and we'll make sure to get that to, um, to Linda as well and or our presenters. So um, we are gonna move on now to Ava. It is your turn if you would like to, um, there we go. I'm here, like can you hear me? Yes. yes, we can okay. hear you. 
Well, thank you, thank Beautiful. you, thank you, Linda, for all this valuable information. It's really wonderful to have everything under one umbrella. And uh, you did a terrific job, uh, Linda and Avant. Thank you so much for the resources. I think the Heritage School really will appreciate that. I want also to thank you, Joyce and Masako and the board of the coalition for providing a wonderful um umbrella to network and to validate heritage learning and to give us all the necessary tools and resources that were lacking from our field. We really appreciate that. Um, I just want to say that I am, first of all, uh, in this context, a language representative. I represent modern Greek. I am located on the West Coast, California. I have been teaching Greek at Stanford University for many, many years. And I have been directing a program of less commonly taught languages. And especially for the less commonly taught languages, all these resources are invaluable. Um, the American Association of Teachers of Modern Greek, which uh, I represent, I'm the president of the organization, um, has been composed by members uh, who are heritage schools. So we don't have members only that are individual teachers, but a lot of our members are schools that are located mostly on the West Coast, Portland, Seattle, California, and some on the East Coast. Our role in the learning and teaching of modern Greek is basically providing professional development mentorship and also um, having some programs for learners that require bilingual skills. For example, we have a program which is called Archaeology After School and requires uh, students of the Greek diaspora to be bilingual if they choose so in order to uh, participate in the program. You can use only English, but also for those who want to participate and improve their uh, the skills in uh, modern Greek, they can do the bilingual part of the program. So all these come together for us. And it's very important to know that there are places where we can find the information, we can inform the teachers and then the parents, the community. The parents and the community, they always ask of um, things that are out there that align with the learning and um, the schooling in American schools, not only Greek schools. So you have to be aware of standards, of um, uh, common core curriculum, everything that has to do with updating uh, the field and the teachers and the community, because uh, it has to be a quality product. What we offer has to be of high quality. And all of these things, everything we talk about here tonight, uh, speaks of quality. Not only quality, but also enthusiasm and uh, motivation, incentives. So I want to talk a little bit about um, the process we follow with the Greek schools, community schools, and um, what are the challenges and how the schools have been uh, handling the whole situation. So if I can go to the next slide, uh, which I can't see. Okay, so I want to say a few things about the process and uh, what um, the Greek schools are doing in order for their students to obtain the seal of biliteracy. Uh, there is a test that students who are interested uh, in testing their proficiency, they can take. It's a test called the Linomathia. Basically, it's the Sefer test, and uh, it's in Greek, but it's based on the Sefer. And it is available through the Hellenic Language Center in Greece, which is under the auspices of the Greek Ministry of Education. There are centers in the United States that administer the test and uh, the tests and the uh, testers 
are located in the United States, I would say the proctors. Also, students have to apply for the test in advance and uh, the test is administered annually. You cannot take it anytime you wish like other tests. This one has to be annually and it is at the center where you belong. Um, there are centers in, uh, they, I think they have to have a distance among them, something like a hundred uh, miles or kilometers, I'm not sure. Now, the students have to pay a fee. I'm not sure how the fee, uh, what the fee is exactly, but I know that there is a fee there and the students receive the results. They have to get at least a B, level B, proficiency rating and above in order to be able to obtain the seal of biliteracy. Most of the students, I think Linda, you mentioned that, they are around um, intermediate mid. And I, I would say for some languages, maybe a little bit lower than that, between low and mid, intermediate. So there is a process that, this, that the schools follow However, the process, the, the results of the tests are not always accepted or recognized by several districts or across states. There is a, a struggle, I would say. Many, many places will uh, request different tests. They will request um, um, something that will prove, prove that a student is capable of the level uh, in comparison to the Actofel test. Uh, and uh, colleges and universities, and I know uh, from my personal experience at Stanford, uh, most of the time they will not accept the results of the separate test. So that's a challenge. Uh, the American Association of Teachers Modern, of Modern Greek, in partnership with the community-based schools, is trying very hard to promote the seal of biliteracy. And everybody loves the seal of biliteracy and they want it to be implemented. Several times, there is uh, something about clarifying the process to people. I mean, today we got a lot of clarifying points, but there are questions. What is the seal of illiteracy? How can I prepare for that? Uh, what are the results? How, how long does it take? I mean, there are a lot of questions. So we are trying to clarify the process, to clarify requirements and criteria that are related to the process. And we want to work on acceptance of the European proficiency test results across school districts. That may be um, done in some places, but maybe we need to do some extra steps. I have talked with Linda about it and she has given me valuable information and maybe um, she can add to that. We, our uh, goal is to have this uh, self test accepted. Uh, however, it's not, as I mentioned, it's not easy for all districts, for all states. And uh, in our work, there are so many steps and so many stakeholders because the test is done in Greece, uh, it's European and it, and it is under the Ministry of Education and there are centers where the test is um, executed. So uh, there is a lot of steps that we need to cover and we need uh, to be um, involved in all discussions. And of course, everyone wants to uh, have incentives for our students uh, to get maybe credit in college and to be recognized for their work because there are always students who work hard, their teachers work hard, they prepare them for the test of uh, uh, by literacy, the award for by literacy, and they prepare them for the test. It's a long process, and we don't want uh, to leave the process hinder 
the whole uh, effort that we are putting out there. So I really appreciate the knowledge and the information. And I think that the schools are eager to have that in order to proceed in the most a profitable way for the students and the community. I want to thank you very much. I don't have anything else to add. Maybe Linda, you can, before we get to questions, maybe you can say what you told me about the alignment of the test. Well, I would just say that, and, and I wanna make sure we have time for, for all of the presenters, but that there are some states that will accept, as you said, yes. the suffered tests or some suffered tests because they don't know about all of them that may be out there or that exist. So that's also um, sort of on the heritage program sometimes to inform the schools or the states about what might be available mm -hmm. um, so they have access. Um, the Global Seal does um, have um, separate tests. You can search if you're looking specifically for an actful test or a separate test on that test finder that I shared with you. Mm -hmm. um, we have a number of separate tests as well as the actual tests that have been um, qualified and approved by our board of advisors. And so that is a, another kind of opportunity. Um, in the case of the Global Seal, your certificate will identify which scale test was taken. Mm -hmm. um, so that the universities or um, the schools will, will also be aware. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ava. I know we had a few questions in the chat, and I think some of your presentation addressed some of those questions. Um, there were questions about if there would be other Greek tests accepted, and I think that's part of what you guys were just talking about. Um, and then there were some people there. I just want to make sure that you check out the chat um, as we share it with you, or if you have time now as well before everyone leaves, because there were some people who shared information with you and contact information where they may want to reach out to you and, and talk to you about the Greek. It's in, so, it, it is on my last slide, if you can put it up. Yes. A Prionas at gmail.com. Yes, and I will actually, I will put this in the chat for everyone right now. If you would like to reach out to her, there is her email there. And you all are going to have the chat. You'll get an email tomorrow where you'll have access to the chat and all these links and information that we've been putting in there for you as well. So thank you so much. That was very, very um, helpful. Okay, so our next presenter is um, Masako Douglas. If you would like, um, Masako, I can progress the slides for you or I can give you the mouse. It's up okay, to you. So should, I, should I send the request to remote the control? I will, I'll just, I'll just give it to you. So you should right. have access to it. it. There may be a little bit of a delay um, and I, I'll try and make sure not touch it so that it doesn't steal it back from you. So okay, go ahead. Thank you. So Hi, everyone. Uh, I would like to share one uh, Japanese community school's effort to award their students uh, for their bilingual and biliteracy you know, the proficiency. And this is a, the one of the school uh, named Orange Coast Gakuen Japanese School. We call this OCG, which is located in Southern California. That is a heritage language school. And let's see. If I can't afford the slide. Okay, um, there we go. Okay, thank it you. It just takes it takes it a second. So could you could you find it? I'll just uh, send the cue, okay? Okay, okay. I can <laughs> so <laughs> OCG encourages the high school students to get both certificate, state seal and the global seal of biliteracy. And this Global silo bilateralism is really important for community-based schools because community-based schools award this, um, you know, that global seal. That means their name is printed in the certificate. And this is a great opportunity for the community schools to be very visible. So I think this is very important. Okay, next slide, please. So this is a typical process to obtain to uh, certificate in that school. First, students take AP Japanese exam at the public uh, high schools. 
and with the AP score three and above, and the proof of English proficiency, such as California Assessment of Student Performance and Progress for English Language Arts for English Native Speakers, or English Language Assessment for California for English Language Learners, a student obtained the seal of literacy by, by their school. And then next step, students uh, submit their AP scores and the uh, proof of English proficiency to the Global Seal of Literacy Coordinator, who is a high school level teacher at OCG. And coordinator applies the Global Seal of Literacy by sending the scores. So far, our students could take AP Japanese, most, mostly AP Japanese exam at the public schools. So they don't have to you know, take other tests again. So this AP exam in English, English uh, the proof are used to get the second, second award, Global Silo by Literacy. But if some of the students can, unfortunately can't take the AP exams because uh, their high school doesn't have Japanese program a neighbor school wouldn't let them take the uh, AP Japanese. But, you know, even if they can't take AP Japanese and seal of literacy, but they can get the global seal of literacy by taking um, other one of the qualified Japanese tests, which is listed in the site where, uh, which Linda showed before. And uh, they just submit the proof of English proficiency from high school and then they can get the global seal of literacy. So ideally, I hope all students graduate from high school and OCG with two certificates. Next slide, please. The reason for that OCG student can graduate with two certificates is a dedicated work of the global seal of literacy coordinator who teaches a high school level at this school. And then to make the student a head start, she approaches sophomores and their parents and provide information of state and global civil literacy and how to get them and constantly remind them to talk to the high school counselor and to take AP Japanese exam. They tend to postpone or forget about it. So constant monitoring and <laughs> reinforcing is a clue, both students and parents. And after her students have taken AP Japanese, again, she tells them to get the AP result and the proof of English proficiency as soon as possible. And then she applies to global CELA literacy. So this is a very long process and takes uh, more than two years, starting from the preparation for the AP exam and ending with our words. So without her commitment, uh, our student can get graduate from OCG with two credentials. I really appreciate it for her effort. Next slide, please. Okay, however, there are some challenges. Uh, I put, I listed two challenges. One of them is that the student take AP exam in their senior, senior year. So this is, as Linda said, it's a problematic because the score comes available after college admission deadline has passed. So they cannot report by literacy credentials in their college admission and miss a chance for advanced placement in their college Japanese courses or college you know, the credits and so forth. So therefore, it is very difficult for them to realize how good these awards are because they can't feel, feel the advantage of holding these awards. And another, Challenge is that the, despite the global silo by literacy coordinators' hard work and encouragement to obtain their credentials, some students and their parents are not <laughs> enthusiastic. We say, take it, because you know it doesn't hurt. You just take it. But they say, oh, okay, and then no response. So this is really kind of you know disappointment sometimes. Okay, so next next slide, please. So here are possible solutions, I can think of it. Uh, first, if possible, we recommend our student to take AP Japanese exam in a junior year, not senior year. Uh, there's a great chance that junior year students in the Japanese heritage language track pass AP exam with a score of five. Last year, they did it. So uh, instead of waiting for AP until senior year, 
we might say say like, okay, take the AP in your you know junior year and then see how it goes. So this might be one of the strategy. And, or uh, they can take, or instead of AP, they can take one of the qualified tests in their junior year. That might be another, you know, way to get it. And for students to realize their accomplishment, uh, they should see how the credential works for them in an academic world, you know, in the form of such as an advanced placement and college grades. Uh, credit so they really need to experience this rather than just like a paper like a certificate it it's just not you know a good motivator so they 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 really think what is good for them okay and uh i think the other way is okay so um yeah so to inform the students and the parents better maybe we have to have like an information video, a clip about state and global syllabus by literacy of students and the parents. And we post it on the, the school's homepage so that parents can access it all the year round. And also another video of the voices of the students, not only Japanese as a heritage language, but other languages uh, who got the credentials and their parents' voice too. So I, I was going to ask Linda if there is any good short clip of video for this, like an information video, as well as student and parents' voice of this getting that award. And uh, okay, and the next next slide, please. Okay, so this is uh, the excitement impact on students and parents and the program uh, that the school. They have the award presentation, um, both certificate and medal, school pay for the medal. So the, their school student get the medals too. So presentation of certificate and the medal at the school morning assembly in front of all the students. Well, that is good to the younger student know what's going on and then they can just see it and they say, okay, when we get that level, we can get it too. And then also, uh, I'm so excited that, that about this, like this fact that our students in these two pictures, they are the first recipients of the global seal of biliteracy among all the Japanese heritage schools in the United States. So they are the first one. And their pictures is posted on the, uh, the <laughs> global seal of biliteracy website forever. So. I think this is a good thing for them too. Whenever they see it, they see them there. So I think it's really good. Okay, so this is about the, the one the the one school's effort to just you know grant their students to uh, the the recognition awards. Although you know see or state, but important thing is they graduate with two hours. Questions are uh, just to send up the question to you. You're welcome. So to, thank you so much, Masako. I think you had some great ideas and very practical ideas and approaches um, that I think most anyone in any language could appreciate and try to implement. So thank you so much for that. Um, I know Linda did put in the chat that there are videos and we are going to be sharing with you in just a minute. I'm going to put all of the different social media links for the Global Seal into the chat for you, but you all are also going to have a copy of the slide deck as well and of the chat with all of those things. So don't worry. Um, does anyone have any other questions? or things that you would like to share or ask Linda or Masako or Eva um, that we could address for you before we wrap things up this evening. You can put your questions into the chat if you have any, and if you think of them later, obviously you can always reach out to us later as well. I'll give you guys just don't, a moment. All right, yes. one thing. Can I ask uh -huh. if you have of questions, continuing questions, or if you like to share the information, please post your message to the online forum 
of the coalition website. Yes. Yes, oh, yes. And then everyone can benefit from it everywhere. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Yes, that's such a good idea. So make sure that um, you go in and access the coalition's website and then get into the forum um, that Moscow was sharing with us about earlier. And um, this video is going to be posted for you tomorrow. So if you want to share it with others in your school or in your community, um, or if you want to go back and revisit something that maybe um, you want to go back and, and go look for the links or the community um, for how to get logged in there, you'll have access to this video tomorrow. Um, so don't worry about that. Um, I do want to make sure that everyone also is aware that on December the 1st, we're going to have another webinar that we're going to be offering with the Coalition of Community-Based Language Schools. Um, and again, Linda will be joining us and we'll have some other guests and panelists. And we're, this, this particular um, webinar is going to be about promoting these pathways to the SEAL. It's going to be having as a focus, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Linda, if anything has changed, but that we're going to, this is going to be very much something that your community or parents may be interested in. It's going to be helping them understand why there is such a value in getting a global SEAL or a state SEAL. So this is something that you've got time between now and December 1st to promote this registration for this um, webinar. This one is going to take place at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, and the link is there for you um, and the QR code if you want to take that down. Um, if you registered and attended tonight's webinar, you'll, you'll get an announcement about this as well as we begin to promote the next one. So don't worry about that. Um, but that will definitely be something those of you who are really trying to be strategic about informing your parents and your community um, and your teachers and your building, that webinar is going to be really, really, I think, helpful for you. Um, okay. I also said, oh, let me, I did mean to copy and paste this into the chat for you all. I got like four things going on at once. I'm trying to like do all the things and not forget something. Linda, did you want to add something? Yeah, I would say definitely invite your parents to this next webinar because the goal of this is to excite them about student opportunities. And we'll share, you know, some students that have maybe earned some scholarships. We'll talk about some universities that are that are offering, you know, advanced placement to your students as heritage learners where they may only need to take two or three courses and they would be able to add a minor to a college degree because of what the work you've already done um, in your programs. So really invite them, think about community members, um, think about community members in your target language that would be excited to sponsor perhaps the test, the cost of testing for your students. Um, that's a great way for a community, um, you know, member, um, you know, a business owner um, that, you know, cares about the language on your culture uh, to get involved into your program is to help, you know, to sponsor a certain number of students who take a test for their seals of biliteracy. So we invite those individuals to learn more about the program as well. That is such a great idea. I love that. I love that. Good thinking, Linda. Um, so I'm going to put this up for you here, and I'm also going to copy and paste all of these resources into the chat for you, if any of you want to grab that, um, because I know you're, I know you're going to want to go explore all these resources. Um, one of the things you're going to find in the link here, you'll find a lot of the resources that Linda has mentioned. Um, the YouTube channel, their LinkedIn, their Facebook group, their Thinks Facebook page, lots and lots and lots of um, resources that you all have been asking about. You'll find a lot of that in some of these links. Um, and also you're going to, when you exit the webinar tonight, you're going to have a prompt come up that's just a quick survey so we can hear from you what was helpful, what your takeaways are, and what you want to learn more about. Um, and that will help inform us for future webinars 
um, to be able to address areas that you would like more support in. Um, and also there'll be a place where if you have questions for someone who was one of the panelists or presenters, you can put questions in there as well. Um, you're also gonna be receiving tomorrow a follow-up email. And in that email, you will have a link to the survey again, if you don't wanna do it tonight, um, but you'll also have a link to a folder and that is where you will be able to access um, the slide deck from tonight, the chat from tonight. You can have a certificate of attendance because you came tonight. Um, and you also um, will have a link to our More Learning YouTube page where this webinar will be posted tomorrow so that you can go back to it there. So I think I've covered everything. I'm trying to think if I've forgotten something. Um, I think that's it. Do any of our panelists have anything else that you'd like to say or share before we sign off for the evening? Thank you all for joining us. Oops. Yes. And thank you for all your, your work on preparing for this. And Linda, thank you for staying up all night to uh -huh. do this. <laughs> I'm going to bed now. <laughs> <laughs> at this point just don't go to bed go get some coffee and start <laughs> it's, it's 3 a.m folks so <laughs> oh my goodness so i thank you everyone for coming please share this webinar with people feel free to share it and um we will look forward to seeing you all at the next webinar on december the first thank you good night everyone Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.